we are uh, starting this panel with living in space. The steps that we need from the step from station, space stations to live in a different world that we know so far. And we have some wonderful persons that will join us in this discussion. But let me first frame the moment that we are living nowadays. We are very, living very complex moments in terms of uh, uh, the unbalanced relation that we have between ourselves and our planets. And also these geopolitical tensions that we are living that uh, probably we are contributing to extinction ourselves. I don't know, probably this is one of the reasons that we are looking up to find some probably alternatives from ourselves. And this is uh, what uh, probably we'll discuss if we are ready. And uh, just uh, some figures. Uh, we were in the moon, 69, we landed. So far we are 110 billion persons already living on Earth, but only 12 walking in the moon. So the question here is, is this adventure for the humankind, or this is for some of us, some few persons? And what is really the perspectives and the fictions, the border between the fictions and the reality? Currently, the narrative is quite uh, simple to go to the moon, and it's a complex, real adventure. Going to the moon, it was uh, really an adventure for one nation with an incredible budget. It was so complex, maybe comparable what the Portuguese they did in the 15th century, right? To the discoveries. And now they bring to us the media, some entrepreneurs, that will be so easy to go back to the moon. It's not. It's difficult. And ourselves, we are a biological... We have a biological body, we have some constraints, we have an aggressive environment in outer space, but then they come with Mars. It's also too easy to go to the Mars, but it's not, it's really complex. So, what we will discuss here today, and I will tease you my guests too, try to look to the technology, what we are doing, what are the steps that we need to do to put ourselves in this track. And particularly, we will conclude in our discussion the importance about that. Probably, we don't have time to be this cosmic species that we want to be. Probably, we need time to fix some things here on Earth. One of the things is maybe we need to change our genetic genome because we are too fragile to go to this adventures. Maybe we need some time, more, maybe 50 years, to settle ourselves in the moon, or in the moon or in the Mars. The moon is, it seems like more tangible. What kind of technologies, propulsions, power generations, what we are doing to assure the steps to a long living in a deep space? So I will invite uh, my colleagues from the panel, I will start with Michael L.A. Michael L.A. is uh, one of the classics... Michael, please come to the stage. He's one of the classics uh, of space exploration. Mike, probably you don't know, Mike has a, a record, American record, to extra vehicle activities, right? Yes. It's still your, your record, right? Yes. So you see, you, and I, you did seven missions, seven, six, six. seven? Six, Six missions. Okay. He's uh, a, a, a vice president of uh, Axiom Space, and this is one of the persons really in charge of this private uh, uh, endeavor to uh, uh, settle uh, more permanent persons in, uh, in orbit with Axiom Space. Thank you. Have a seat uh, Thank you. Uh, here, or I don't know, here. How about here? Yeah, you could be there. Then, Tom, Tom Shell, where is Tom? Tom, please come to the stage. <laughs> I will say. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I will say that Tom is a, a recruiter. This is a person that uh, uh, are fishing someone to go to uh, the space stations, to new uh, um, perspectives uh, for space exploration. So we will have is a vice president of uh, private crew recruitment uh, 
uh, Visat, VST, VST. I don't know how to vast. Yeah. Vast. Okay, yeah. how to pronounce. And of course, Antonio. Where is Antonio? Antonio, Amorim. It is related with corks. Antonio, can I sit here, please? And this is one of uh, the most impressive uh, materials, raw materials that we have, particularly that uh, it was uh, quite useful in the Saturn V in the program Apollo in the 60s. And this is, in fact, what put ourselves, Portugal, in space. It was in the 60s with the cork. We will back to that. And don't forget one thing, when you open the bottle of the wine in the cork, you just uh, put your head that uh, this is related with the space technologies, uh, natural space technology. So I will uh, thank you, gentlemen, to be here. I will. I know that you have some uh, photos, videos to share, uh, and I will start with you, Michael Lele. Uh, and uh, do you want to pass now your videos? Yes. There? Yeah. You pass the. Okay. Video. Very good. I will have a seat also. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction. And uh, it's great to be here at Glex once again. First time in Porto for Glex. First time in Porto for me. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to see many familiar faces, but also some that I don't know. So to put things in context, I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, Axiom is doing in order to help us live off this planet, um, whether in low Earth orbit and in the future on another celestial body. We're a company that is um, wanting to build the world's first commercial space station. And our company motto and um, mission statement are here. I won't read them to you. I, I trust that you can do that yourselves. But our plan is to do this in three phases. So phase number one, is that we are sending private astronaut missions to the International Space Station as it exists today. To put all of this in context, the ISS is an amazing vehicle. Uh, it's been flying, first modules launched in 1998, fully inhabited by 2000, and has been continuously so since that time. 71 different expeditions, so different groups of people have been on board uh, many, many experiments. Fundamentally, it's a floating laboratory, so we take advantage of the microgravity uh, environment to learn things about basic physics, but also uh, advanced technology development, etc. But it is a machine, and at one point it's going to wear out, and when it does wear out, the five partner agencies around the world have not expressed any desire to build another commercial, sorry, government space station. So that's where commercial space stations like the one that Axiom and the one that VAST uh, are proposing come into play. So the first step, as I said, is to send private astronaut missions to the ISS. So far, we have done three of them, AX1, 2, and 3, that happened in 2022, 2023, and 2024. Uh, here you see the significant contribution, or I would say participation, of other countries. So our the five agencies that I mentioned represent 15 countries around the world. And until 2022, unless you are one of those 15 countries, you could not mount a mission to the ISS. So it was a fairly closed club, if I may say so. And starting in, in 2022 with AX1 and continuing until just recently, we are expanding that list of possible visitors to include not only more countries, but more individuals. Uh, think about research organizations, think about companies that have something that they want to demonstrate or prove out in low Earth orbit. Um, so our, our goal is to expand that market by conducting these operations. The second reason that we do that is because by doing so, we learn how to conduct a space mission. If we're going to have uh, our own orbital space station, we have to have the operations team in place. We have to understand the communications. We have to understand the organization. All of the millions of details that go into running a space station mission, uh, we are learning step by step as we go through these. So let me just play a quick video which sort of highlights or summarizes uh, AX3, the last mission that happened. We launched in January, landed in February, and we'll start hearing from my colleague Marcus Want of Sweden and his thoughts.
for some reason, every time I think about the countdown, it starts at T minus seven seconds. I don't know why. Seven. Six. Five. This is a spaceship Freedom. Here we are above the Earth. Amazing ride uphill. We're very proud to be representing Axiom and our nations here. I couldn't be happier to be here and prouder of my guys. That's just a great job all the way uphill. On behalf of the uh, Expedition 70 crew, I'd like to welcome uh, Axiom 3 on board the International Space Station. Welcome aboard Axiom 3, station we're now resuming operational audio communications. I am very proud of my AX3 crewmates who helped their agencies achieve all of their science objectives, technology demonstrations, as well as the outreach events. So what I really hope this experience as a family will uh, bring to them, it's the self-confidence that nothing is really impossible. I want to be an example and I want to be part of those that make something impossible possible. This is not a mission of a single individual. This is not magnifying a name. This is just the ignition moment. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. Absolutely magnificent experience. I think it probably is best told by the video, but if it wasn't obvious, we had an Italian, a Swede, and a Turkish astronaut on board, the very first Turkish human to fly to space. And this is representative of, as I, as I described before, we are trying to open the aperture to more countries. Ricardo, you mentioned is, is uh, space exploration just for 12 people who walked on the moon or the 600 or so that have been to orbit. I think the answer is no. We would like to increase that, again, to more countries, more individuals, et cetera. So that was phase one of our programs. Phase two is to launch modules which will attach to the ISS. This is obviously helpful because we don't have to launch the entire space station in one module, but can add incrementally to it as we are taking resources from the ISS while we operate in conjunction with them. And this will take place over several years. The first launch is scheduled for 2026. And then at some point, phase three is that we'd undock from the International Space Station and become the, an orbiting laboratory and hopefully the destination for not only the users that, have, that are today using the ISS, but also the market that we will have developed in the meantime. So you must, you must be ready before the 2031, right? Yes. Our target this is 2028, to be ready okay. by 2028 okay. to, to operate completely independently. So I look forward to... Ricardo's expert moderation into your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. What, what is the feeling to sit in a bomb 
that go in, a bomb, a powerful bomb that <laughs> going up when you are take off. Richard, I don't know if you said this, but I heard somebody say there, when you light a rocket, 10,000 things can go, can happen, and only one of them is good. But so I'll you be are a lucky guy. You are a lucky guy. You don't really think about that. I, I would tell you that training takes care of everything. And first of all, if you really were going to worry about that, you probably shouldn't be an astronaut. But even those, and I think healthy concerns about safety, sort of fall by the wayside when you're sitting there and you're hearing the countdown and you get to less than one minute, then less than 10 seconds. It's just excitement. You're very focused on your job. You want to make sure that your responsibilities are, are first and foremost taken care of. But as, I, as I've flown several times, I notice that with each time, I'm less worried about making a mistake, and I'm more in tune to just enjoying the experience, which is, it's unique. I mean, there's no way to describe it un un unless you've sat there and you felt the incredible acceleration that seems never ending, at the end of which you're going eight kilometers per second. Imagine that. Uh, that is, it's just a, a, an amazing ride. Then you get to zero gravity and you're floating in this beautiful, tranquil, peaceful world looking out the, the window and seeing the earth. Not quite from that vantage point, but um, one that makes you very humble and, and very appreciative of the place we live. It's all about also training, right? Uh, a lot of training to be prepared, uh, physical conditions. Uh. Our training for a private astronaut mission is minimum eight months um, because we have to learn how to operate and live and work in two vehicles, the SpaceX Crew Dragon that takes us there, but also the ISS, what to do in case of an emergency, et cetera. So it's pretty intensive. And then all the science experiments take some training as well. I'm asking you that because you are the only person here that flew in, the, in the, this powerful rocket. So, mm -hmm. And the, I, I do have a, another question. It is the, the dependency, uh, your business, it is at the end, this is a business, the dependency of the launch systems, so and the costs of the launch systems. This is the bottleneck of the, the business? It's very important. Uh, by far, the lion's share of the cost for a mission to go to space yeah. is the launch cost. And, and so we are not a transportation company, yeah. we're a destination. Our uh, provider currently is SpaceX, so we buy the service from them exactly how NASA does it. You know, NASA, when they developed the commercial crew program, they let SpaceX operate the rocket, keep the international uh, intellectual property. And so that is a service that they sell to NASA and they sell to us and they can sell it to other people as well. Yeah, because uh, what we have been seeing that uh, the costs of launches rise again because there are some lack of launches. This, uh, this is uh, some kind of monopoly. And what is the perspective to reducing these costs? Uh, to be more democratic to have access to space? Well, certainly other? we need some competition, I'll be frank, okay. in that field. Um, there is, I would say that SpaceX has been fairly fair about the cost. And it has gone up, but mostly just to cover the cost of inflation. Yeah. So even though they could, they've been fairly reasonable, I think, as partners. and. Um, you know, it's important because they realize, I think, that someday another company will come along and that uh, goodwill that they have expressed to us is something that we'll remember. And the final question that someone of you that must be thinking, this is a one million question, the one million dollar question. If I go to my pockets, how much money that I need to put in a table to fly in these uh, missions? So I, I, maybe some, some of the persons here, they are asking what this is reduced compared to the governmental, uh, let's say, approach to the uh, corp of astronauts, uh, the private business, they will reduce the costs to... Yeah, I would say that if you ask a million dollar question, every time you go to your pocket, you take out a million dollars, you'll have to do that a few tens of times. <laughs> um, and, and it is definitely expensive for an individual to do that, but we've had four of our nine okay. customers, four of them have been individuals. I think it's quite accessible for a nation to do that. Um, and so our, we're, it seems like the demographic of our customers has changed a little bit from individuals to governments. Uh, we would very much like to fly a Portuguese astronaut on an orbital mission. We are working on that. Okay. Huh? First of all, that I will mention to the Secretary of State that we will join our Temis our courts. Maybe this year we are working. Let's see. Uh, but 
we have opportunity to have a word on that, even in the con European context, of course. Uh, One more uh, thing about the price. I think if you look back at commercial aviation 100 years ago, it was also extraordinarily yeah. expensive. And now look what's happened. So we can hope, I don't know if it'll take 100 years or maybe longer, maybe less, but I'm pretty convinced that yeah. the price will come down and we will get toward this we used to call it democratizing, but I think normalizing the experience of going to space. Something. Yeah, no, Tom, this is uh, the question is also for you. But before that, uh, uh, Tom, you have something also to share with us, right? A video? You have a video? Uh, yeah. Let yeah? me let me give a quick introduction before we very play good. the video, if that's okay. So, um, so thank you very much, first of all, for for inviting uh, me to be here and to to join this uh, this uh, great panel. So Vast is a new company. We're the new kid on the block, if you like, in the, in the space industry. And for you know, those of you who are paying attention, I'm sure you've heard uh, the Axiom story before and you're familiar with the great accomplishments of, uh, of Mike and, and his team. Um, Vast came out of uh, uh, hibernation, if you like, uh, about a year ago. Um, we now have uh, over 450 people working on building a private space station. But let me tell you why we're building a private space station. I'll give you a little bit more context as to why. The one thing that we have learned over the last or first 60 plus years of human exploration of space is there is one limiting factor in why we can't spend longer time in space and can't venture further, and that's the fragility of the human body. Yeah. Uh, we're used to living here on Earth in gravity, in space, you take that away, it's a very, it's a fun environment to be in, right, Mike? It's a living in weightlessness. The stories I have heard is, uh, it, it's an awful lot of fun. Uh, but it has some detrimental effects on the human body, whether it's the change in uh, intraocular pressure that can change your, your eye. There is a new study that came out just this week about uh, effects it can have on the, the kidney. Um, there is bone loss. And there are various studies that are going on to try to mitigate these uh, conditions, to try to, to find ways of minimizing those effects. But one possible solution is what if we had a way of creating gravity in space? So create the environment that we're used to here on Earth, but to do that in space, it's called artificial gravity. And so Vast's long-term vision is to spin our space station to create that artificial, in gravi artificial gravity environment that may, if that is successful and it's proven uh, to, to work, allow us to then venture much further and deeper into space to Mars, possibly even beyond in, in the future. But that's the long-term purpose and objective of VAST as a company is to try to enable uh, uh, artificial gravity. So with that, can you play the, the short video I have just to introduce the company? I don't know, I don't know if you, you need to go out. So what you saw being built there is our Haven 1 space station. This is our first station. It will launch before the end of uh, next year. So a very ambitious, very aggressive uh, schedule. We're closely partnered with uh, SpaceX, who will provide the launch for Haven 1 and then the transportation uh, for the crew. If Haven 1 checks out uh, when it's on orbit, uh, then the first launch of crew should happen in early 2026. And so that's, uh, that's Vast's initial objective. We will do work in microgravity on a, a small private space station and then build from there 
towards the long-term vision of uh, creating artificial gravity. So that's it. So you are competing at the end. We are competing, yeah, of course. That's and the, the nature, but, but I think uh, the space industry is also very cooperative. Mike and I have known each other yeah. in, in different forms uh, for 15 years. And, but yes, ultimately we are competing, but there is space for multiple providers within of this course. industry. We're competitors. Competitors, that's a nice way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> and uh, for instance, you don't need some kind of uh, uh, raw materials with a specific... Um, behavior, uh, thermal protection, then I'll jump to you, Antonio. Uh, <laughs> probably you need that. We huh? do, okay. and actually... Yes. You are here, you can make a business huh? immediately I've in tried our stage. Huh? That, that is, it's a very good point. Um, Vast is a company, we are new, we have we, we a long list of, uh, of things that we know that we need and that we're shopping for, and so we're open for, uh, you know, for partnerships with, uh, with countries and with their suppliers, and um, very I'm, good. I'm looking forward... Not just to, to use uh, cork, possibly on, in, in any exterior application, which I know uh, has a track record of, but also as an interior. Yeah. A lot of, if you look at the picture of the space station, and I think Richard, you can attest to this, it was designed by engineers without too much thought of the humans who are living inside it. Um, we're now coming into what I call the third generation of space stations. So we're now able to design yeah, with a little more thought. The basic question of how do you keep humans alive in space is well answered. But now we can look at the design and we can look at the interior, we can look at lighting, we can look at sound, we Completely can look at different. smell, yeah, and try to yeah. figure these out to, to create an environment that is enjoyable and beneficial and it's good for the mind and good for the body and maybe yeah, Cork can help us with that. Um, I, I will not reveal the history because you, you have some videos that we will do it, but before the, the, this conversation we had a short uh, talk about uh, the history of Amurin and particularly Amurin Corks uh, uh, because this is, as I said in the beginning, this is somehow related with our history in space, in the 60s, in Saturn, in uh, Apollo missions. And uh, we know that you are an, uh, an entrepreneur, that uh, you saw particularly this uh, business opportunity, and you bought a factory or uh, a business in the U.S. exactly to uh, uh, increase or to reshape your value chain, uh, particularly in the, in the, in the cork do you want to talk about that history? Sure. Yeah? Sure, you will sure. start with the video? If you want to get yeah. start with the video for yeah. the people that are a little bit less yeah. familiar then with Then we work, will evolve so in the discussion. I can introduce you to this yeah. unique Portuguese material. Let's do it. Let's do it to the video. Can nature and technology team up? Can humankind find inspiration from natural materials? Can innovation benefit from processes that arise naturally on our planet? Absolutely. There's one special natural invention that has fueled man's imagination since time immemorial. Discover the natural born technology. Although apparently simple, its unique properties make it ideal for an expanding range of high-performance applications that no man-made product can emulate. Thermal insulation. Gaseous components of cellular structure present low conductivity to heat and noise transmission. Acoustic isolation. Reduced sound propagation due to the material's low density. Damping, a cellular structure that is highly effective in energy dissipation. Resistance to fire, slow burning due to low mass composition and cellular structure. Chemical resistance, a combination of suberin, seroids and tannins provides great resistance to humidity and chemicals. Elasticity and compressibility, a flexible and closed microcellular structure with internal gas. Impermeability to liquids and gases. The presence of suberin in the cell walls renders it impermeable. Abrasion resistance. The honeycomb cells are highly resistant to friction. And lightness. Over 50% of its volume is air, making it very light. In today's smart cities, you'll find this unique material used in windmill blade de-icing systems.
impacting the power industry. As an engineered compound designed for railways, drastically reducing energy consumption in advanced railway applications. Improving people's daily comfort through high performance solutions in heavy construction projects. Repeatedly being used in aerospace programs, constantly defying gravity. So the next time you think of innovation, just consider nature's amazing invention. And think of cork. Cork, the natural born technology. I'm quite wonder that uh, it's amazing, huh? Few persons knows that, huh? Because uh, we need to respect again. We need to respect when we open the uh, bottle of wine and look to the <laughs> what we have on the top. Huh? So this is incredible. Uh, it's a unique material. material. It's really a unique material, born in nature from nature. So we're talking about the bark. We're talking about the skin of a tree that takes 25 years for us to get the first time. And then we harvest cork every uh, nine years. Of course, that the most common use is a stopper for wine or for champagne or for spirits. But uh, uh, all we work at uh, our company is to develop uh, uses for cork, such as uh, aerospace. And NASA has been the long-term partner with, uh, with our company and with cork. NASA. Tell, tell us about this. Yeah, story. I mean, NASA called, called cork uh, nature foam uh, with a, a combination of unique uh, uh, properties. And it was through the NASA, together with the company that we have based in Wisconsin in America, that the whole of cork usage for the space program started. Cork has this unique uh, characteristic that I think in scientific terms we call it an ablative material, which is cork is a material that can absorb energy without decomposing itself, meaning that it works as a thermal protection shield, allowing for people to go inside the capsule or for materials to last, like, compo like electronic components, to last in, uh, in, the, in the several what space uh, 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 programs. Uh, we have been uh, working in space. Uh, with, uh, with NASA since the 1960s, so Scout, Mercury, uh, Saturn, in the 70s, Apollo, Ariane, I think that Cork yeah, has Ariane been used also, in yeah. every single uh, uh, launch of uh, Ariane, the Space Shuttle, I think that uh, we have since the, the, the beginning of the Space Shuttle covered the nose or the fairings of the uh, uh, Space Shuttle, as well as Cork being used in uh, uh, satellite uh, rocket uh, boosters. I mean, when you mentioned SpaceX as the company that is providing uh, all the launching programs, that's today our biggest customer in the world because there is, you have to transport people to space. People would love to go to space, but they also would love to come back. And I think that uh, <laughs> it's very important that that's we find point. a way of uh, allowing for them to come back. And cork is probably the only material or the material that has been identified up to now as the material that can really resist to these huge temperature changes. That's the photo that you're seeing is a different element because normally we have a, a cork used in slabs in a very flat uh, material, but we are developing ourselves technology that can Shaping, uh, shape no? yeah. cork in a different way. Cork is probably has an advantage about, uh, apart from being a thermal shield, it's really a flexible material, and we wanted to make it more flexible so that we can use it in, in, more, uh, in more parts of the uh, uh, space launches, and hopefully in the future on the uh, space stations as well. So it's basically due to the performance, due to the proven track record of Cork, that this is clearly a fast-growing 
application for our company. And today we are working with SpaceX, with Vega, with the Artemis program that was already uh, mentioned, companies like Blue, Blue Origin, companies like Beyond Gravity. Those are regular customers of ours from our Wisconsin uh, uh, facility. So this just shows that Core can really be using, used for uh, multiple uses and uh, 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 applications. As an astronaut would, uh, that visited us in, uh, in the US, he said, uh, you know, thank you guys, because I think that probably I owe to your material my life. So his final statement was, do not leave Earth without cork. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the conclusion that uh, we have the cork, but we need to uh, in Portugal to build a rocket to put the cork, right? Well, okay. that's, the minister is here, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, we have uh, roughly six minutes uh, to conclude our uh, nice discussion, and uh, I have a question for all of you. This is related to the future, related to ourselves, and uh, particularly what um, is your view about this presence, a more permanent presence, humans in space, and for what? Uh, I know that there are some discoveries, some experiments that we are carrying out in the space stations. We, are, we have a long track record, particularly international space stations, with some experience, and some perspectives to cure of some diseases, uh, cancers, uh, new medicines uh, in orbit uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, the question is, uh, again, we are quite dependent of launchers, we are, the economy, the space economy, in particular the, uh, what we expect in orbit servicings, that we will force us to be more permanent also in orbit, is really dependent the capacity that we will develop to lift off and put mm -hmm. the things in, the, in space. Based on that, and you, we know that it's quite difficult, this is a challenge, uh, we know that we are preparing the Starship to uh, to probably to bring some new adventures to this endeavor, but what is your view about the future? You, in two years uh, or one year, you will have your uh, initial uh, space stations. You already uh, did some uh, some advances in your um, uh, also in your initiatives. But in your view, what will be the future? Where will be in 2014 or 2035? So you've got to look at why humans are traveling to space, right? There's, a, there's an innate curiosity that we have as humans. It's why an awful lot of people are here in the, in the room. We want to explore. We want to push the boundaries. And space is one of those boundaries that we wish to, to explore. And there are a number of reasons. It's just curiosity, but also as a backup plan in the very long term. Right? If there is uh, something that happens to this wonderful environment we have here on Earth, we need to have a capability as a species to try to exist somewhere else. And so it's a very long road that we're on, and there's a, still a lot of problems, a lot of questions that need to be solved. Um, and it's going to take many generations, I think, to get to the point where humans can live sustainably uh, outside of the, the atmosphere um, of Earth. And so when you break it down into where are we going to be in a, in a couple of decades, it's very hard to predict. But the pace of change today is a lot quicker than it was 20 years ago. So I think okay. in 20 years' time, you're going to see a lot more launches like Starship taking exponentially more material from Earth uh, into space. You're going to have multiple providers of, uh, of places for humans to live in space. And you're going to have a lot more human activity, whether that is scientific uh, research or, as you point out, in-space manufacturing. There is a lot that can be done within the microgravity environment that continues to benefit life on Earth, but also with a view to being able to explore further. So I think there, w the space world will be very different in 20 years' time. Yeah, uh, Mike, what is your vision? I, I have to share Tom's enthusiasm about the future, and I'm going to come at it from two in some ways contrasting, but um, I think both valid reasons. First is this innate desire to explore, and I don't just mean explore what's on the other side of the mountain, but explore the, the things that we can learn 
by taking advantage of the microgravity environment. So you mentioned some of these health benefits, uh, materials processing, things that we don't really even fully grasp now because the government that uh, the governments that put the ISS together have sort of a horizon on what they can do from an experimentation standpoint. They can understand um, behaviors, they can adjust those behaviors to try to make something good, but they can't produce things in mass, they can't make money, and that's the other end. So we have exploration as a, an innate human desire on one side, Another innate human desire is making money. And once we start realizing the commercial potential, and I'm not talking just low Earth orbit, but on, on you've certainly heard that on the lunar surface, there is water ice. We think we can take that water ice and make propellant and oxygen, yep. et cetera. We can take the regolith and make structures. So as soon as you unleash the commercial, uh, powerful, innovative powers, like you witness in, in the boom that SpaceX has created in the launch market with okay. being able to reuse things. So once there is a reason to go someplace, the commercial companies, I think, are going to outpace the governments. Um, and, and why that's appropriate, it's happening in low Earth orbit today. The governments are now focused on the moon, maybe one day Mars. Why? Because nobody's figured out exactly how to extract resource from the moon yet. But once they do that, Stand by, because there's going to be a rush. Yeah, this is the point. I will uh, go to Antonio. Uh, do you believe that you, we, we can see it, the coke in the, in the, in the, in the moon, in the environment? It has been there. It has yeah, but been there. The plants growing and... Uh, we have plenty of space here. <laughs> to do that. But uh, look, I think it's part of the human, uh, human race. We always want to test our own boundaries. We're always going to go beyond what is supposed to to, to happen. I mean, probably 500 years ago, the Portuguese have done the same with our yep. uh, navigation skills. And we have to also to see uh, uh, the, the implication on the impact that uh, the space uh, program and the space research and everything that we have to go beyond ba boundaries in science, in other business activities, in other, you mentioned health, you mentioned transport, you mentioned uh, so many things that really can b benefit with the research that uh, is being done on uh, aerospace. So I think that the, the spillover impact that the space program can have the on other business is incredible. And that's yeah. why we would like to, to, when we see Cork being involved on the space, I mean, we really believe that we can do every, almost everything with this material because if we can really take it to the very high-tech uh, um, scientific uh, requirements, requests that the space programs do have, I think that uh, on planet Earth we can really do a lot more with such an incredible material. So that's our takeaway from the space program. It's not, not, not only a business on itself, is uh, the potential that this material has because it has been recognized by the most sophisticated uh, companies and research programs on, uh, on, on Earth. So I think that's uh, the takeaway that we have from all this space usage of Cork. Yeah, this is a challenge. I need to, to conclude. There are some triads here that you need to conclude. You need to conclude. <laughs> but before that, uh, let me just uh, uh, put some, uh, um, some words in the words of uh, Michael Lee, which is the resources, probably uh, these ambitions to explore new resources, uh, the extension of the geopolitics uh, that we have uh, nowadays, and looking space as a militarization, probably a militarization of space, could be some of the challenge that we have in front of us. And of course, do not forget one very important thing. Uh, moon, it not belongs to you, to me, to you. Uh, this is uh, humankind, and we need to regulate. How can we extract resources from the moon? How can we uh, apoderate ourselves with the surface of the Mars? Uh, so, I think we have a lot of work to do here on the Earth to try to regulate ourselves, our ambitions, and uh, probably if we do it, uh, we can look maybe in this perspective that uh, all the evolution of ourselves could be, um, lead us to be really, uh, have time to be a, a cosmic 
spacing, uh, interplanetary spacing. Probably this is the, at the end, the goal of our evolution. How can nothing or the atmos we build our body, our brain, and try to also to put questions in how the things works to be ready to be outside of our own. Uh, probably, I don't, I don't think we will be destroyed so soon. The, the hurt, but uh, we need to take care because the future uh, depends what we are doing uh, nowadays, and particularly uh, to take care about our hurts. I think this is, uh, again, this is the best way to conclude. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your insights and. Uh, uh, to bring to us these wonderful perspectives of uh, the space. There we go.